Hi, this is Eliza Inkberry with Darkside University's Gothic Gardening course, and this is going to be a two-part segment on edible flowers, um, partly because I'm having some technical difficulties and my computer keeps crashing, so I am hoping that splitting it in half will make it so that my computer does not mind that I loaded lots and lots of websites instead of just photos. It seems to really act up if I'm using actual websites, probably because of everybody's ads and all of the extra um, stuff that's downloading, but um, I'm going to start off with a couple of books. I have an extensive collection of books that have edible flower information in them. Some of them or are devoted just to that topic, and others of them um, have just uh, a small segment on edible flowers. And I think my two favorites include this one, which is The Edible Flower Garden by Rosalind Creasy. And then uh, this one basically has almost the same title edible flowers uh, from garden to palette actually and uh, it's Kathy Wilkinson Barish and both of these are really nice they have about the same quantity of information they're both really beautiful books so if you're looking for a coffee table book I have the paperbacks but you could get the hard covers and um, lots of recipes lots of growing information if you have um, a desire to know more about how to grow any of the plants that I mention. I'm not going to go into growing details too much because you do all live global and the growing instructions that I give um, may not apply to everywhere. So if you're having trouble wrapping your mind around how do you grow a certain thing or will it grow in your region, um, turn to the uh, discussion for week three and four and um, ask some questions there about it and I'll be happy to talk to you about what will grow there or if there are any substitutes, uh, so let me know. Um, I'm starting off, uh, assuming that it switches, yep, okay, so I'm starting off with um, one of the most well-known edible flowers, a lot of people don't realize they're eating a flower, and this is an artichoke. Um, the reason it's called an artichoke is this stuff right here that looks nice and thistly, it is related to a thistle, um, when it is still in the bud like this, is this kind of layer right here in the artichoke of um, kind of a golden colored um, fuzzy stuff that if you try to swallow it will make you feel like you're choking and it's definitely no fun to eat so when you are preparing them you want to take that out. Um, artichokes are um, the same family as cardoons uh, but they're bred to have really fat flowers not the same family, it's the same species as cardoons but they're bred to have these fat flower buds whereas cardoons are bred to have fat stems so you can eat the fat stems on the cardoons you could do that on the artichoke but they'd be kind of skinny and less um, palatable and and vice versa if you tried to eat the flowers of the cardoon like an artichoke that would be fine to try you just wouldn't get as much food out of it because they're smaller so here's how to cook and eat an artichoke if you need this you can go to this website which you can see the address up here and uh, if you have uh, low res on your computer maybe your computer is kind of slow and so it blurs the image so that um, it will run faster on your computer just let me know and I'll send you the link up there if you can't actually read it and you feel like you're squinting or, or something um, I'll be happy to to send you the link um, this is uh, black locust, which are one of my favorite edible flowers. Um, you know, I have kind of two categories of edible flowers. I have one where I consider it actually worth eating as a food uh, because it tastes good or it's substantial in some way. And then I have the ones that I consider confetti, like edible confetti. They're just there to make things pretty, and I have no problem with that, but. Um, I really get excited about the ones that have um, a little extra to add culinarily and aren't just there for looks or kind of a garnish aspect. And uh, black locust flowers definitely are quite tasty. If you've ever had jicama, they taste like that mixed with honeysuckle. So they have this sweet floral um, beanie crunchiness and they're very crunchy. Um, I like them in salads. I really like to put them in pasta salads as a way to use them. And I thought that this um, black locust flower pancake recipe looked good. So I was gonna give that a try. 
this is um, pineapple guava. I think I've mentioned it before. Um, I wanted to point out right here, you can see on this flower that the petals are gone, but the pistil is still there. And because of that, this flower is going to ripen into the egg-shaped tropical fruit that's very tasty. And you know, when I'm eating the flowers off of this plant, I don't want to eat the flower and then not get a fruit later. So the nice thing about this is you can actually cut the petals off right about here and you won't damage the um, stamens and pistil so it can continue to go on to pollinate and make the fruit. Um, these petals are very uh, sweet and sugary and have kind of a fruity floral tropical flavor so they're really good with sweet stuff like um, sorbets and uh, fruit salads and things like that or you know I just eat them in the garden like I'm eating strawberries because they're that tasty. Candied flowers is another thing that a lot of people have seen, and they're very easy to make. Um, I make mine with egg whites, uh, especially since I have chickens, so that's pretty easy for me to do. Uh, but some people don't like to use eggs, uh, especially raw eggs, so they use water, which you can do. Um, and so I've got um, some recipes for you to use, but basically it's just kind of dabbing it on and then dipping the flour in the sugar, and then you're going to want to let it dry and then store it in a dry airtight container because these are very um, attractive to critters. And you might want to put a desiccate packet in there. I don't recommend one that's for shoe boxes. I would use a food grade desiccate packet and that'll keep it drier. Um, if you keep them dry, they'll last a very long time. And so what you see right here is these are all different kinds of violas, and that is a family. So there's a lot of different viola species within the same family. Uh, most of us are familiar with, say, pansies in the violet family, viola family. Um, and then we might be familiar with, say, uh, violets that look like this. And if you're in Europe, uh, most likely those have a really beautiful fragrance. And uh, people make candies and jellies that have a nice, strong floral scent to them. And you may have had violet candy before. And so that's um, viola odorata. Um, the one in the U.S. looks almost exactly like it pretty close and um, it's um, viola sororia and it's so similar but it doesn't have a scent really I mean you can kind of stuff your nose on it and sort of smell something but it's definitely if you've ever smelled a viola odorata or eaten candy made from it you know it is not the same ballpark at all one is so much superior to the other culinarily but they both can be used in those recipes. Any viola can be used in those recipes. So if it's a woodland one or, or anything that is in the viola family, viola being the um, genus name for um, all of those plants. So here's uh, viola sororia, which is um, common in especially the southeast of the United States. It can actually be kind of weedy. Um, apparently it's the state flower of a few states, so it looks like it grows up north too. Um, and there's a blue and white version. Um, there's a named version called freckles that's blue and white, and then there's another one that's more like uh, white with some blue veins on it. Um, and they're both they're both very pretty. I also use them to dye Easter eggs. They're um, they're very useful. But um, this one is the viola odorata that um, smells so good, and um, and you can see it looks incredibly similar. So here's some ways to make candied violets. Um, and there's four different ways on here. So if you want to look up this recipe, that's a lot of different ways to do that. And then I wanted to include a link that showed pansies. These are all um, violas, and they're bred to have these different face um, patterns on them. They're not the same species as the viola odorata or sororia, but um, they have a really nice wintergreen flavor that I like a lot in salads and on uh, fruit and things like that. Um, and the nice thing about these is that there are black options or um, maybe you want to do um, the, uh, hang on a minute if it'll scroll down, um, kind of the deep dark blue midnight colored ones or something. So so that give you, gives you some goth options in, in um, decorative, I mean, culinary uses for flowers. Um, and while I'm on the subject of um, 
making candied uh, flower petals, um, roses lend themselves well to that too, and they're delicious to use in um, cooking. Uh, you may have used rose water before, maybe you were making Turkish delight or something along those lines, and um, and those are, uh, you can get, you know, the rose water and make things, or you can make it yourself. Uh, so fortunately in that case, the um, black roses are often, um, they're not really black, they're purple, but they end up looking blacker once you've dried the petals, and so that gives you another uh, goth option there. Um, here's a rose petal sorbet that would be pretty delicious. And um, I liked this idea a lot. And this is where you don't even have to candy them. Um, the nice thing about rose petals is you can really just dry them. And they're very likely to, um, to keep well, yeah, especially if you have a desiccate packet or something, you need to store them dry. And then you can just crumble them like confetti that has a nice fragrant on just shortbread or, or anything that you're making. Um, and that, again, would be a way that you could maybe use a, a dark purple, almost black petal. Um, I did want to point to this little segment on the petal. A lot of people think that tastes bitter, and, and that's true on a lot of different kinds of flowers. So um, you can give that a nibble, and if it tastes bitter to you, just pinch it off before you dry it. And then you don't have that added to um, your uh, dried flowers or your preserved flowers, um, or you know if you're using them fresh. So squash blossoms are another more common um, edible flower, and a lot of people like to use the male flowers because they're not going to ripen into a zucchini or a crookneck squash, or you could use one that, because uh, when the uh, flowers uh, get started, they usually have a very baby squash attached to them, uh, and so you can pick them when they still have that little baby squash on the end, and. Um, and, and the flower and stuff them like that and so you get a little bit of actual squash in with your um, edible flower. Um, this is um, a fudge recipe that uses cornmeal and it looks really good to me. You know, I wouldn't have thought of using cornmeal in fudge, but it's a ton of sugar and cream and butter, so I really think you can't go wrong with it. And um, I like the idea that it has a little bit of salt flakes, um, because I like salt a lot. Um, and this one's a calendula one, but it looks like they have a recipe on here for corn flowers and one for lavender. Um, so I think this is kind of a master recipe that you can put whatever flower you happen to have into it. And speaking of calendula, um, it's a commonly used substitute for saffron because it's way cheaper than saffron and still adds that color. Um, it doesn't have quite as nice a flavor, but it is a, a nice flower. It's got a little bit of a bitterness to it. Um, it's used for a lot of different things, and it, it's a good uh, beneficial insect attractor in the garden as well. A lot of these are. Um, so getting into the goth category again, uh, nasturtiums are another option where you can choose a really dark colored flower. This is black velvet nasturtium, and um, these have a lot of culinary uses. They're related to brassicas kind of distantly, um, and they, uh, you know, they're not they're not that close to say um, a cabbage or a broccoli or a turnip or something. Those are those are brassicas, but. Um, they are related to them and they're edible and um, they have a peppery flavor to them. And if you've ever had papaya seeds, they taste exactly like papaya seeds and, and I guess they must have the same compounds in the plant. I don't think they're related to papayas, but um, you can stuff them. Uh, this looks like it's probably a, an herb cheese mix and you can go and look at this recipe if you like, but it made me think of blue cheese and it occurred to me that I thought that blue cheese would be very good in a nasturtium. And another thing that you can do with them is you can um, you can pickle the kind of immature seed pods and um, just gonna scroll maybe there we go uh, and so you can pickle uh, the seed pods and they are a good caper substitute because capers don't grow all that well in areas that get a lot of humidity and stuff and definitely there's some temperature requirements there so if you're unable to grow actual capers which are a pickled flower bud um, you could grow um, nasturtium seeds instead so this is a um, 
kind of deconstructed salad, which is uh, really popular in gourmet restaurants. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel about it sometimes since you pay so much money. I mean, it is nice and you are kind of paying for artistry. So I try to think of it as going to a play instead of going to get a meal. But um, it's, um, you know, use here ha uh, with the chive blossoms is more decorative, I think. And uh, you can see some chives in the picture, too. But uh, the thing about chive blossoms is they do have a really nice flavor in any of the allium. Uh, family flowers are edible, so all the onion flowers, um, garlic flowers, and so on, um, any of those are edible. Um, so um, what I tend to do is I pinch off this little part of stems right here because I don't really want a big mouthful of, of flowers all at once. So I pinch that right there and then these all break apart and I can sprinkle them more like confetti into whatever I'm making. Um, this one lends itself, this is more chives, and it lends itself especially well to chive butter. Um, all the herbs and, and flowers make good butters. Um, and the way you make this is really, really easy, and it impresses people a lot. People are easily impressed. I mean, I guess they go to restaurants all the time and they don't make food, so it looks amazingly hard to them to get flowers into butter, but all you do is leave the stick of butter sitting on the counter for a little while. It gets soft. You stir in the flower petals. You put it in some sort of mold, stick it in the fridge, and then you pop it out of that. Later you just turn it over. Um, a lot of times I'll put wax, wax paper in the bottom of whatever mold I put it into so it's easy to pop it out later. And then you can garnish with some fresh flowers so people know what they're looking at. Um, and then they'll just go on and on about how good it is and how on earth did you do that. Um, if you're doing a sweet butter, you might want to add some sugar or honey. And if you're doing a salty butter, then of course you might want to add some salt. Um, these are just little uh, cheeses that have had the flowers pressed into them. They're just, um, there's nothing in them and, that I know of because uh, there's no recipe here. But um, this is just a, little blocks of um, goat cheese that have had uh, flowers pressed into them. So if you're lucky enough to have goats and can make goat cheese, then that's something that you could make. Uh, this is something that I like to take to um, potlucks, and I do it a lot in the summer. Um, because again, it's one of those things that's incredibly easy, but think people think it must have been hard, and they are impressed visually because it's so pretty. Um, so all I do is I take a bowl about this size, and I put a piece of wax paper in the bottom, and then I kind of dab water on each of the flowers as I'm arranging it. You can see how this is arranged in kind of a pattern. And you can do any kind of pattern you want. And here again is an opportunity to add a goth flare to it because you could use black petals, red petals, purple ones, and do any kind of design that appealed to you. And so you um, you put the flowers on in the spot you want them to be once you're, you're done with your mold. And then you take little um, golf ball sized pieces of cheese and you press it in until it's about a centimeter thick against those. And, uh, and they hold it in place. You may have to kind of shift a little as you're doing it if one kind of slips, but um, it's not too hard. And so once you've got that bottom layer on, um, what I like to do is I either make a pesto or if I'm in a big hurry, uh, I'll, I'll buy a pesto and I like if I buy one I usually get a, a sun-dried tomato pesto and then I, I spread that in the center but I leave about an inch on the edges all the way around that doesn't have the pesto on it and then I fill in the sides and I put a layer on top of cheese and um, then I just stick it in the fridge for a little bit to kind of set and get uh, cool and, and firm and you can just pop it out on a tray with um, crackers or, or sliced bread or whatever you want to serve it with, vegetables. Um, this one here, it looks like they're using some large basil leaves and a calendula flower. There's some red petals that might be roses, but they don't look like the right color or shape. And then those could potentially be borage flowers. Um, these cheeses also may be much smaller than the ones I make. Looking at this and, and the type of flowers, if those are really borage flowers, then this is a much smaller cheese than the one I make, because I usually use up about four of those larger um, soft 
goat cheese logs to make this. Uh, so this may just be very tiny uh, and same here, but you can make them tiny or large. Uh, maybe you could use different fillings in the center, but that's kind of a any kind of edible flour will go sort of recipe. And if you wanted to make it sweet instead of a savory one, you could use maybe a peach chutney or something in the middle instead. Um, so here's a pineapple sorbet with pineapple sage blossoms and pineapple sage is uh, salvia. All the salvias are sages. Um, and I like these a lot. These are some really tasty flowers. They do tend to have ants for me, so um, I'll leave them on the counter or put them in a bowl of water and make sure all the ants are off of them before I start using them. Uh, so you may want to inspect them pretty closely because they get these really, really tiny ants where I live. Um, but they're quite tasty and I don't find that the um, end of the flower right here is bitter on these at all. Uh, it has a pineapple, almost like a faint hint of banana, but a pineapple flavor to it that's, that's, that's really nice. And um, I like the color contrast here with the pineapple, but um, the thing that really appealed to this, uh, to me about this one was that uh, this morning at about 5 a.m., my husband was making tapache, which is a fermented um, pineapple drink that um, he had on the top shelf in our living room because um, it has to ferment for a bit. And we heard this pop and then this faint tinkling of glass and it had exploded all over our living room and it took out um, a router. So I'm actually down at my mother's house right now using her internet to make this video for you. Um, and the bright side there is that her internet is faster than mine, so it's uploading the videos pretty quickly. But I looked at this pineapple sorbet and I was like, hmm, no fermenting, like that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, tapache, it's good. Uh, I can't have it right now because I'm pregnant, but um, it's kind of like a, an alcoholic, cidery pineapple drink. Um, Here's more sage. This is culinary sage, like the one that we use as rubbed sage or we use for turkey dinners if we eat meat or um, that kind of thing. And the uh, flowers on this, I usually pull them out of this little um, calyx right here and just use the flower. So you can see on this where um, it doesn't have a green part on it. And that, that little white part was attached to a green part and somebody pulled it out of there. Because the green part's edible, it's not as tasty as the rest of the flower. And a lot of edible flowers are like that. So you just kind of gently tug it and they'll usually pop right out of there. And you can use those for a lot of the same recipes I've just been showing you. This recipe really appealed to me. Um, lavender macaroons with orchid buttercream. And I don't know what they're talking about with this orchid liquor. Uh, maybe um, one of our students who is really into orchids can tell us, but um, it's this that's uh, kind of exciting. I sort of want some, but I can't have it right now. Um, but I also thought, you know, you could call it this if you were just using vanilla extract, because vanilla is an orchid, and so anybody who's talking about vanilla being boring, I just kind of laugh at them. I mean, you're eating an orchid. So um, this looks like a, a really good tasty recipe that I would love to try. Um, I might try to find some natural food coloring though because I'm not a huge, like I just, I don't, I don't know, it, it kind of turns me off when food is like kind of a naturally brilliant color. Um, but I like it when I dye things with beets or, or something. Oh, and that actually is a really good um, point I should make too. Sometimes I dye the goat cheese with beet juice, which makes it this brilliant, almost bloody fuchsia color. And then I put um, contrasting color flower petals like um, borage and, and, and cornflower, like these really good cobalt blues in there with it, or yellows. Um, and so that's a really pretty way to make it as well. And then I usually use some sort of... Um, savory kind of uh, spread in the center and sometimes I even use beets uh, so that's another thing um, and this is this is a picture of lavender so um, if you didn't know what lavender flowers look like and you can just use any of these you could just pop these off almost like your um, your uh, shucking beans out of a, a shell or something you just kind of slide your finger down the stem and these all pop off and you can use those and you can dry these really easily they keep well they work good as that confetti uh, i like them a lot sprinkled over chocolate if you're making um, some sort of truffles that's a, a really nice um, garnish it has a good flavor with chocolate um, 
This is an edible daylily. It's the one that a lot of us call ditch lilies because you might see them growing in the ditch in the south. Um, it's it's kind of the truest of type. It's the one that people who are serious um, daylily collectors, excuse me, um, find kind of um, boring. I guess is how they they feel about them. I think they're really pretty. Um, they do get kind of overlooked, uh, but they're the ones that have not been messed with so much because when people are breeding daylilies, they're not breeding them to be more edible. They're breeding them to be more unusual color-wise and aesthetically. So uh, a lot of times they've bred them to taste really bad, and some of them have even made people sick. Uh, so I recommend that you stick to ditch lilies and a lot of the yellow ones tend to um, be safe to eat. So you may want to start small with the daylily if you're trying a new one and you're not sure if it's an edible one. You may just want to eat a small piece of it and see how you feel and see if it tastes good because if it doesn't taste good then don't eat it. Um, and so these can be used a lot of different ways but one of the ways to use them is you see this unopened flower bud in the back and those are harvested in um, in a lot of areas of Asia and called golden needles and they dry them and they use them in soups and stuff and you can actually go to Asian supermarkets and buy golden needles and you can find a lot of recipes for them online so that's one way to try uh, daylilies. The other thing about daylilies is their greens are edible at certain times of the year. You need to look that up and get it right and not eat too many at first because um, that's another area where you might discover that you're going to spend a lot of time in the bathroom afterwards if you get it wrong. Um, this really weird, weird flower is arugula, and I find that in the hot weather when my arugula gets so spicy that I can no longer just eat it raw, I have to make it into pestos and things like that, or cook it into quiches or whatever, um, that the flowers remain just kind of that lighter weight arugula flavor and I put a whole handful into a salad or a pasta salad or, or anything that I'm making and it doesn't get too hot. Um, the other thing it has a nice uh, faint sweet um, nectar taste to it as well so it's arugula with a little bit of sweet hint to it. Uh, I couldn't decide which dianthus to show you. Um, all the dianthus have edible petals um, this is one where you probably want to pinch off that little area at the tip where it's attached. And you can kind of see, like right down in here, when you pull that petal, that little that little thing's going to come out of there, and, and that tends to be bitter, so you may want to pinch that off. But um, all the dianthus have kind of a clove flavor to them. Uh, they're really nice, um, and uh, carnations are a dianthus are a dianthus, um, but you definitely do not want to use florist flowers for edible flowers because those are so heavily sprayed. Um, they're just incredibly toxic. Please don't eat florist flowers. So definitely buy yourself some carnations or um, pinks is, garden pinks is a, a common name for dianthus. So any of these, there's one uh, called heart attack that is a very, very deep red, almost a black red, very I, I would say it was it was more of a blood red, and uh, so that's a, that's a nice one. It's also that's a very um, heat tolerant uh, variety of dianthus, and it has a good smell. And a lot of the white ones tend to smell the best to me. So speaking of a flower with a really fragrant, um, nice smell, this is elderflower, and um, it's the flower of an elderberry. Uh, so if you've heard of elderberries, elderberries are used as well, um, but the flowers have a um, natural native yeast on them and they can be made into um, an elder bug, um, and a bug is a ferment that you're making. Uh, so you can make fizzy drinks, you can make a little champagne, uh, there's ways to distill it into liquor, and um, here is the liquor. A lot of people um, make fritters out of these big kind of flower heads, so they'll dip that in batter and fry it. People will fry anything, but it is a very tasty thing. Um, they are good. Um, this is the kind of um, elderflower liquor that I'm used to at St. Germain. It's very good with tonic and a Meyer lemon. If you can obtain a Meyer lemon, I'm sure a regular one would be very good as well. Um, it's got a very strong floral scent to it. Um, 
And then another very fragrant plant that a lot of us might be used to but not really have thought about much is um, tea jasmine. So if you've ever had jasmine tea, you're having um, jasminum sambac, which you can see the name of right here. Um, and it is the sort of edible um, jasmine that you can use for making jasmine tea. Now the thing about it is you don't actually put the flower in your teacup. Um, if you've ever bought loose leaf, leaf jasmine tea and looked at it, you're not going to see any flowers in there. It's just going to look like a regular um, green tea. And the reason for that is they don't actually um, leave the flowers in there. It's a very uh, time-consuming and meticulous process. Um, and you can buy, I have a um, made of Orleans and it grows in my um, kitchen window. Great. It's uh, blooming almost all the time. Uh, and so if you wanted to make tea yourself, uh, this site here shows you how. And it's, uh, and this, you may not be making it at this scale, but if you were to see you have a tea plant and you have some jasmine and sandback, um, you can pull the flowers off the jasmine and mix it in with the tea leaves you've just harvested. And then you mix the flowers up um, and you want to make sure they're not going to mold or anything. And what happens is the fragrance from the jasmine kind of adheres to the tea leaves. And then they take the um, flowers out after that process happens. So they pick each one of these little flowers out of your tea and that's why jasmine tea tends to be so expensive. Um, it's definitely worth the money to get a good jasmine tea and I like to get the fair trade because then you know that this person is being paid for picking all these little flowers out of there. Um, this is uh, linden flowers which are also used to make tea and these are actually left in the brew. Uh, so they're a little bit easier for, say, the, um, the home gardener to use as a tea flower. Um, and they're also a major bee plant. So you're, if you're a beekeeper or you just want to do nice things for bees, um, this is a plant that uh, they really appreciate. Um, and so linden trees, they get called lime trees in Europe, even though they are not related to citrus in any way. And they get called um, basswood for the native ones in the U.S. Um, and they also have edible leaves when the leaves are young, but and you can coppice them, which means you cut them at the base and they'll grow into more of a shrub than um, a tree if you keep doing that. Uh, so it's something that you can keep small if you want to. Um, and then uh, this is osmanthus, and there's a lot of different species of osmanthus. There's some that, that do better um, in cooler climates than others. Uh, I don't know about really cold climates though, but this is another one where the actual flowers remain in the tea and uh, flavor the tea. Uh, it's got a nice evergreen leaf to it if you're in the right climate. And since I'm talking about tea, I'm going to end this first half of the edible flower lessons with tea hibiscus, which is a flower calyx. It's like the um, the base of the flower and so it's fleshy and kind of tart and you use it um, to make um, teas that taste like the um, celestial seasonings red zinger tea that most people have had um, and there's a lot of different hibiscus teas but that's basically it's hibiscus sabdorifa and um, you can go to this article on my website if you like and see um, you know, how it's harvested and grown and some tips on that. Uh, so that's it for part one of Edible Flowers and I hope you will now watch part two.